welcome you all to the Every Brain Matters monthly speakers meeting. I'm Aubrey Adams. I'm the director of Every Brain Matters, um, which is a community pro with the primary mission to support and advocate for families impacted by today's industrialized marijuana. The Every Brain Matters community seeks to create a culture of healing by helping each other, finding connection, drawing strength from one another, and finding a pathway to serenity and freedom. And we know that the road to recovery is not easy, but together we can find hope in our shared experiences. We welcome Ben tonight. He is 23 years old. He is in recovery um, from cannabis use disorder, which led to broken relationships, anxiety, agoraphobia, I hope I said that right, bouts of paranoid psychosis and suicidal ideation. We appreciate Finn's willingness to share his experience, strength, and hope with us tonight. And we hope that we all learn and grow in our recovery from his experience too. So we thank you, Finn, for being here tonight. And I'll turn this over to you. And I'm here to answer any questions to Finn that you might have during the meeting. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm Finn. I am a marijuana addict in recovery. I'm also an alcoholic in recovery and kind of a LaCroix addict at this point as well as a result of stopping those two. Well, active LaCroix addict, I guess we could consider. Um, I wanted to thank Aubrey for uh, letting me speak at this meeting and share my experience. And I also wanted to thank Mary for connecting me to the Every Brain Matters organization as well. Um, if any of you are wondering ahead of time, that is... My hamster, she's sleeping. She does during the day. Her, her, her name is Buttercup, and she is my partner in crime and the love of my life. Uh, okay, so my story is one that kind of has a lot of twists and turns. Twists and turns. Uh, it involves like a DUI car crash situation at some point. Uh, there's a lot of suicidal ideation, and then that's all kind of later. I just wanted to start kind of from the beginning. Uh literally from birth to say that I shouldn't be here. I was born with underdeveloped lungs two weeks early. So happy that I'm still alive and kicking. Um, but that's kind of a running theme in my life is that I've been had situations where I should not be here, but I had it pretty good growing up. Actually, I think it's important to say I had two loving parents who are still together and they're still in my life, both of them and uh, my support system. I love them both. I grew up in an upper middle class family. You know, I, I they put me in piano lessons. I was like in a private kindergarten. I mean, I had I had a good I had a good life as a child, and um, I was an only child too because they didn't want to go through that whole almost dying thing again. So decided against that much. Um, but I did exhibit some early addictive behaviors. Very early, like from the age of six, I found video games and I played them for hours and hours and hours on end. To the point where it was super, super concerning to my parents. I would eat food endlessly. The yeah, gap was very concerned about the amount of peanut butter we were purchasing on a weekly basis for PB and J's. <laughs> and I've also always been in codependent relationships constantly. And most of this, as I found, is an attempt to not think anymore because a lot of my thoughts end up being uh, negative, very negative and, and self-directed negatively. Uh, I'd like, it's always felt like life is just sharper than it has to be. And that's really the only way I found to describe it up to this point, because for the most part, everything is okay, except my brain convinces me that it's not. Um, I also realized a lot of this is a result of undiagnosed ADHD from a very young age. And as I've had, had showed those symptoms at a very young age, and as I found later on, uh, as I've been talking to nurse practitioners and whatever else, uh, any other medical professionals about it, ADHD, people with ADHD don't really stand a chance against addiction. We really don't, or at least it's, it's very much a, uh, kind of a pipeline directly to becoming an addict. Um, so I guess the real question is, how did we get to the whole car crash thing or whatever in the end and the suicidal ideation? If we come from a good childhood, how did we get over to 
to that. Um, my introduction to marijuana was uh, through a girlfriend at the time. I was 14 and she was 16 and she was smoking like endless amounts of weed all of the time. And I think I told her at one point that I couldn't be with her anymore. She continued to smoke, which I think is the funniest thing I've ever said in hindsight. <laughs> That's hilarious because uh, that was my exact situation later on down the line. But she gave me weed for the first time and I did not want to feel like anything else ever again, but exactly how I felt in that moment. I Things just were lifted from me. I suddenly didn't have to think about anything anymore. And that was the greatest gift I felt like at the time that, that anything had ever given me. Um, so I then started going to great lengths to get it through high school. From 14 on, I had a, a weed dealer who lived, he was like 50 years old, by the way, dealing weed to a 14 year old, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, he was 40 minutes or like 45 minutes across town one way. And I say I was going somewhere and walk there every one or two days. Um, buy some of what little money I could scrounge up. I just lie to my parents and say I needed it for whatever, did it for my friends, never pay them back. Just already doing the addicts, I'm stealing money from people behavior from the age of 14. But really, I didn't have enough money or enough time for the addiction to progress. I mean, I was, uh, it was in high school band. I spent a lot of time in extracurricular activities or in school and I was just busy. But I think if I hadn't had that situation, if I had all the free time that I had later on in college, it would have been just as bad then as it was later. Um, so I go to college, I go to college and I find smoking friends, lots of smoking friends. And that's really fun for me as it is for many new people in college at the age of 18. And I, you know, a lot of those situations, I still think to this day were fun. I still think that they were really fun because I, I was having fun with my friends. But the problem was that after I went home from these smoking, like the outings with my friends, right? I'd just go home and smoke more in my room all night. Then I'd wake up and I'd do it again. Uh, rinse and repeat, just ad nauseum. Just doing, I'm doing homework while high. Well, attempting to do homework while high, sometimes doing okay at it. And simple tasks suddenly seem so much harder. Like going to class was nigh on impossible, at least in my own brain. People were like, you can't just go sit there. It's like a five minute walk from your dorm to the campus. And I was like, yeah, but then I have to get out of bed. That's a lot. But it, it really felt impossible. I stopped talking to my parents. Um, I didn't really have any friends. I really didn't communicate with my girlfriend at the time that much at all. And uh, then COVID hits. Co COVID hits and kind of screws everything up for me in a way that it did for many, 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 many people. Um, so I, I move in with my girlfriend and her roommates. I move out of the dorm. I just move in there. I'm not actually on the lease, but I'm just kind of freeloading for a while. And we are smoking all of the time. But more accurately, I am smoking all of the time. I remember frequently getting up at 2 a.m. or somewhere in there and realizing that I wasn't high and then getting up to go outside. So it's just like if and if I had any waking moment where I was not high, it was not okay. It's not okay. Because I, I think about something and that's terrible. It's wrong. I shouldn't be doing that. You know, it's just led me to such isolation and depression and Incredible anxiety, and uh, you know, Aubrey mentioned that I, in my my little prompt, I, I wrote the I, I had agoraphobia. I did, I did. I was I was not going to go outside. I absolutely had no intention of leaving my home because it may have felt like a safe space at the time, even though it wasn't. But it, it was just the only place I could be. And I then I failed in school really quickly. Fail out of school. And uh, just kind of live with the delusion that I'm managing well through all of it. I think it was Pete Davidson at one point who said, and and not that I agree with most of the things he say says, but there's a uh, there's a stand up comedy bit where he's like, I'm high all the time, and 
if I fail at something, it's like, okay, well, I was high. But if I do well, it's like, and I was high, you know, it just gives you the, the platform to say, okay, well, I succeeded at something and that's good enough because I'm already at such a low point that, you know, anything is better than this. So a year later, I turned 21. I turned 21. The day that I always knew was going to be a terrible moment for me. Uh, I would joke about this constantly that when I turn 21, I'm going to become a huge addict. I'm going to, I'm going to buy all the weed I can. And I'm going to uh, buy all of the alcohol that I can from every store I can. And uh, it's going to be over for me. That really, I thought was a joke. But I really did think that was a joke. <laughs> Turns out, no. No, not at all. I, I began doing that immediately. So I'm doing things like smoking while driving. Sorry to say, I'm I'm like have a joint in my mouth constantly. And I realize now it's, you know, it's always a decision to, to drive intoxicated, right? But it didn't feel like that because I just thought, well, I have to go to the grocery store. You know, I have to, I have to go somewhere and I can't not be smoking. So like, what's, what am I going to walk all the way, you know? <laughs> Uh, it didn't feel like a conscious decision to me at all to do these dangerous things. So I, I justify them to myself over and over again. And here's where the paranoid psychosis part comes in. So I lived in a really crappy single bedroom apartment that had a lot of things wrong with it. There was a broken heater that would make a, a bunch of noise constantly. There was like this pipe in the bathroom that would leak constantly. There was a super loud washing machine that would like squeak all the time. So all of this stuff, right? While I'm high, hearing this all of the time, I just had uh, uh, so much anxiety and truly bouts of psychosis about this, about worrying about people being mad at me for these loud noises. And I thought I could hear my neighbors through our ceiling from the unit above us talking about me. Like I could hear individual people talk about these these annoying things i was doing uh so much so that i left them a note at one point and said are are you annoyed by me at all like if you are can you just talk to me and left a phone number and they texted me they were like what the hell what are you talking about <laughs> i've never seen you in my life i've never heard you before who are you <laughs> so that helped but also made me realize that i was going insane Pretty much categorically, I felt like I was going insane. And my girlfriend at the time didn't help. I was frequently crying with the ball in my hand saying, I don't know what to do. And she said, I know you don't. And I don't know what to do either. And I don't say she didn't help in a bad way. She didn't know how to, and she wasn't supposed to. It wasn't her job to do that. I mean, she was also a weed addict as well. So it's just two weed, two incredible weed addicts living together in a single bedroom apartment, both with uh, jobs they hate and uh, no friends. So it's not exactly a great situation. And the agoraphobia also expands at this point. I am like one to two hours late to work a lot because I just sitting there not wanting to leave the house at all. I will like I will be ready for one to two hours, but sit there like kind of looking at the door basically on and off for one to two hours. Uh, at one point I went to check my mail and it was so, well, I went to check it because the USPS sent me a note that said they couldn't deliver any more mail in my mailbox because it had been full for like a week. And it was like filled to the brim with letters. God, what is all this junk mail? I can't believe I let this happen. Uh, so, so we break up. We break up because she goes, I can't do this anymore. I have, you are going insane. <laughs> you are going insane. You are not being a good boyfriend to me because what addict is really capable of being a good boyfriend? Let's let's be honest. What 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 addict in, in incredible active addiction is capable of of being a good anything really to anybody? I, that's how I felt was that I just couldn't be anything to anybody and I was no one. So we break up and I become suicidally depressed. I am crying on the couch with the bomb holding it in my, like, unable to put it down constantly. <laughs> uh, so I think I spilled bong water myself a few times, if I remember. I just fell asleep carrying, holding it, so that's embarrassing. But um, I felt pathetic, worthless, but I just couldn't put down the weed. 
and my parents say, come home, please. Come. Instead of sitting there and smoking yourself to death, please come home. So I did, and I had to stop smoking. It was one of their stipulations. So if I was in their house, I could not be smoking. And uh, I think maybe subconsciously I was like, sure. Yeah. You know, whatever gets me out of here right now. I'll do that. And I did. It was the summer. I was still drinking. She was not helpful to me. But uh, I stopped smoking. And I, I don't know if... Um, Any of you have seen somebody go through weed withdrawal? It's not necessarily the same really at all as like an opioid withdrawal or something like that. You're not shaking, you know, uh, but you are experiencing incredibly unstable emotional episodes. At least I was, sorry, I should say. I was experiencing incredible, incredibly unstable emotional episodes every day to the point where I... Some days would sit in my room all day crying, and some days I'd be the happiest person ever, and there was no in-between, is what it seemed like. I had worse anxiety than even when I was using, even when I was experiencing the psychosis. I couldn't make a phone call. I couldn't to save my life. I sat there staring at the phone for hours, trying to will myself to type in the numbers and hit call, and I couldn't do it. And... We, my parents were like, you got to get on medication. You need, you need something like you can't just sit here like this and, and go insane. You need like a band aid for just temporarily. So they had to make the phone call for me to get me Lexapro, but they did it, which I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful to them for that. And I got on the medication. Oh, that was good. But at this point, I sound pretty miserable. I imagine. Because I was for like three, four years. Miserable. Just a sad kind of shell of a human being. And I knew that. And I felt like that. And I knew I was an addict. And, and I had known that for like two years. And there is nothing worse in life. I really feel like at least there was nothing worse for me than knowing you are an addict, that you have a problem, that you need to stop and not doing it anyway because you can't. There's, there, there is no worse feeling than, than knowing you should be able to control something is how you feel or how I felt. Knowing I should be able to control it and simply being totally unable, um, too weak is how I felt to do it. So at the end of that summer, I go buy uh, another weed vape. My dad finds the packaging that I left in the car so on, the, on the floor of the car. Because I guess I was just so excited to rip it open. I just threw it somewhere. And he's understandably super disappointed. And just feels like I'm losing my son again. Here it is. Here it goes. He's gone again. Doesn't matter. He's already done it. And that was true. So we go back to Bellingham. I'm in my new apartment. I got a new apartment. Everything's cool, but I'm back to active addiction. I'm smoking every hour. Um, the selfishness comes back. The self-centeredness, the anger, the inability to keep a commitment. All of that is back yet again. And again, I feel like there's nothing I can do to stop it. I'm, I know I'm a terrible friend. I'm a terrible boyfriend. I'm a terrible employee. And I, I think I'm a terrible son at the same time. I, I fail out of school again after trying, after lying to my parents the entire quarter about doing well with grades and having that just eat away at me every single day that I was totally and completely telling them lies about my grades and that I was going to class and that everything was going just fine. I wasn't smoking and everything is fine. You know, that's how I've been living my life. It's fine. It's fine. Everything is totally fine. I promise. Even though everything was... So far from fine, it was insane. Uh, so after, I don't know, five months of this, I get fired. I get fired after showing up for two hours late again for like probably the 25th time at this point. They really like me a lot there. But I get fired and it, it destroys me. It ruins me emotionally. My addict ego is severely bruised. 
but I managed to lie my way into a new job. And after a week there is where this whole car crash thing comes in. I wanted to, to preface this by saying that, you know, this car crash is the result of alcohol. It is. Uh, I drank myself into a blackout. It's what happened. But I think the ability to become addicted to, to marijuana, to have cannabis use disorder, implies a greater ability to be an addict at large, really, just in general to anything. I had somebody once say to me, I can be addicted to something that I can do more than once. And I like that a lot because that's how I feel as well. I'm almost not kidding about the LaCroix addiction, by the way. I actually drink like six of these a day. That's just part of me, I guess. Um, so weed is my main addiction, but on this particular day, I smoked a lot at work. I felt stupid for not knowing anything at work. I felt, I felt dumb. I, the building was very hot, all that stuff. And on my break, about 15 minutes into my 10 minute break, I, I drive to a store. I buy, okay, let's not say buy. I stole, actually, I stole it. A bottle of vodka and I drink about, I don't know how much of it. I think there was half of it left in the car, maybe a quarter of it left in the car when we found it. But, and then after that, I don't remember anything at all. And I wake up being wheeled through the hospital. There's a cop behind me. And I ask him, you know, what, what happened? Why am I here? I was just at work. Why is my head hurt? Why is my entire body hurt? What's happening? And he goes, well, you crashed your car through a brick wall of a bank. And I was like, oh, is the car okay? And he goes, oh, no. Oh, no, it's it's gone. Was, okay. Okay. So what now? As I later hear from the prosecutor, apparently what exactly happened was um, I kind of pieced this all together for multiple people, I guess. I was drunk at work. I got fired pretty unceremoniously again, right? They sent me home. Or it's, I don't know, I probably don't care what I did. They just say, you're fired, leave. And I managed to get home on the freeway, blackout drunk. I drive about 90 miles per hour down the road after sideswiping somebody. Should have said that first. I sideswiped somebody, drive about 90 miles per down the road, uh, per hour down the road, like in an attempt to flee, I think. And I suspect that I didn't really care what happened to my life at that moment, although I'm not sure I was making any coherent thoughts. Um, but this is rush hour, like 5.30 p.m., and there's plenty of people around, and nobody got hurt. I don't know how. It's truly a miracle. But I managed to ram my car through the brick wall of this bank at about 50 miles per hour, only after catching some air off the sidewalk, ramming through a tree, through a pillar, and then almost uh, embedding, embedding my car into this wall. And I wish I had pulled up the pictures today because I did at another meeting, but it's... it's um, it's almost impossible that I'm alive, actually. My car is, was, I'm not sure where it is now, but was a scrap heap. It, I show, it was the kind of crash where I showed my mom the picture and she started crying, like sobbing uncontrollably immediately. And I don't know how nobody got hurt. I don't know how I got out of it okay without a, even a brain injury. I, I don't. I didn't have any broken bones. I had a seatbelt rash and uh, my chest hurt a lot, probably from the airbag and falling over, but otherwise I'm okay, which is crazy. So at that point I go to jail for a night Then they strap this alcohol monitor to my leg, which I guess they do in the state of Washington, as I found out. And it monitors my BAC constantly. And uh, that removes the option of alcohol from me, which actually I'm very grateful to the state for doing that to this day. But I decide I can't do weed anymore either. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna test my my pee, right? They're they're gonna test me for weed. But and even before they were started doing that, I thought I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I almost died. 
I, I should be dead. I'm not even convinced I'm not dead right now and just kind of living in on like a spiritual plane. There is no way I'm alive. And it made me think about a lot of things and considered that uh, if I had hurt anybody, I'd be in prison. I should I should have been in dead or in prison, a dead or in prison. That those are my two options, and I don't know how I picked the third one of okay, but kind of sad about my addiction now. Like I got off really easy. Um, but that said, here's the madness of addiction. Three months later, my girlfriend breaks up with me, and let me tell you, I did not wait a second to walk in the pouring rain at 11.30 p.m., about a mile and a half, to the dispensary. I didn't waste a millisecond. I'm pretty sure I grabbed my keys the instant it happened. I had no thought in my head about, there are going to be consequences for this. And that's the madness of addiction. You can have so much resolve to not do it. And then in seconds, it's gone. It, does not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to you at all. So I'm miserable again. I'm suicidal. There's this bridge that I walk over every day to and from work because I'm walking now to and from work. And I, it's an overpass. And I, I, I look over it every day. And uh, I'm a little more interested every time, if that makes any sense. I look a little harder every day. So I finally call my therapist and I say, hey, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to, I might kill myself. Can we, can we talk? <laughs> and he goes, sure. Yeah, absolutely. We can have a conversation. I think you should not do that. He encourages me to get into a recovery group. He actually says, I have another client who is in this group. He's going to pick you up on Thursday. Put his number in your phone. And he, my therapist at the time, no longer my therapist, but he's done a lot for me, was an addict as well. And this is the first in a long line of other addicts telling me to do things and me just listening and having it work out for me. So this guy, this guy who's still a really good, really, really good friend of mine, picks me up. We go to this recovery group. And I think, man, I, um, I shouldn't be here. I don't. I don't belong here. Look at these people. They're either... That one looks... like This is my thought process. That one over there looks sad and hopeless. That one looks like he has his life together. And I, for some reason, felt like neither of those, even though I was definitely the sad and hopeless one. Like I just said to my therapist the other day, I'm going to kill myself. You know, like I... How could I have not identified with that? But I so deeply did not want to be these people. I just... Wanted to be okay again without having to put in all this work. I mean, why, you know, why me? Basically, it's how I felt. Why was this addiction bestowed upon me? <laughs> it's just dumb because it's bestowed upon so many people in life. But basically, it was just a why God moment or why, why, why me? And, and not anybody else you know i had a i had a good childhood I, i'm i'm a good person god <laughs> why me and the reality is there is no answer for that question i have never found an answer nobody has given me anything close to an answer and there is not going to be one i don't know why me i don't know i don't think any addict knows why exactly i mean sure plenty of people have trauma that can lead them to addiction that all makes sense and there are some physiological sociological trauma-based uh reasons for being an addict but but why do you why would i have this inability to put something down that's killing me um i don't know i don't know it's just the hand that i was dealt it's just what i'm dealing with and i think if anybody can give me an answer for that i'll i'll give them all the money i have but uh I don't think I'm ever going to find it. So I'll just keep my money and I don't know, buy some gum. <laughs> but basically, um, I feel better after I go to this group. I do. To my utter dismay, 
these people help me. And from that point forward, um, I go back to the group over and over and over and over again. And I kind of just absorb things via osmosis. And these people are so nice. They're so nice and they're so willing to help. And I don't understand how they're happy or why, but they seem like it. They really seem like they're happy. And if somebody can fake happiness that well, they should win an Oscar. I wanted whatever they had really badly. So I kept going. And slowly, very slowly, sometimes it's a crawl, it's never a sprint. On occasion, it's a jog, right? But very slowly, got there. I relapsed on 422. It's two days after 420. So you can kind of do the math on that one, I guess. Uh, I think I used all my willpower on 420, and then two days later, it was like, nope, that's it. I'm going to the dispensary. I don't care what anyone says. But I've been sober at this point since uh, May 7th of 2023. I think I have nine months coming up here relatively shortly for the first time. I just got to my first ever six months this last time. So that's been really, really exciting for me. I will admit the milestones have become less meaningful over time. And it's more of just about the work overall in total that I've been doing. I am just so happy to be back, basically. I, I Maybe I didn't even know what back means because I started at 14, but like, I'm just so happy to be Finn. I'm so happy to give my mother her son back. I am happy to give people in my life an authentic version of me. All of that has been really, really, truly wonderful. And it's been the hardest thing I've ever done but also the most rewarding. Uh, at this point, I did want to talk about a few things that I heard people say to me throughout my addiction that at the time I was very offended by, but also in context makes a lot more sense and I have hindsight to sort of guide me in what they meant. Uh, the classic, right? I love you more than you love me. Heard that multiple times, multiple people. And I, at the time I was like, no, 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 what, what do you mean? Look, I, I, I put in so much effort to this relationship. Of course I love you. They were right. They were right. I was incapable of providing the same love that they did. I think I felt like I was trying really, 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 really hard. But really, I was just sick and stunted and found it impossible to provide that love back to them no matter how much I wanted to. It wasn't as though I didn't want to. It's the important part. It was that I couldn't. I also heard, I really think that you're a weak man. I heard that one a few times. And that hit me really hard time too. Because again, true. <laughs> Very true. Addiction weakens the brain. It does. It, the portion of it that it particularly weakens is um, your sort of midbrain area where it, you process a lot of uh, empathy, interpersonal connectedness, uh, a bunch of other things basically to do with human connection that kind of make up the soul as we understand it. So I really think that that's a large part of why addicts, there's yourself and your addict self, that's a large part of why I just seemed different and, and, and weak and not me. It's the people who knew me in the times where I wasn't smoking in the interim I was home with my parents for the summer or even before that we're like you're just how are you so mean how are you how are you so mean and self-centered and, and angry and where did all this come from all of a sudden it's your brain gets weakened it does it really really does I also heard is this your first experience with empathy <laughs> man that one cut me really deep that was that's it the deep, the deep cut right there. Uh, and for the same reason that I just talked about earlier, it wasn't my first experience with empathy, but I think it was my, uh, maybe my only one in quite a long time was, uh, that was right. Happened at a breakup actually was when they, when they told me about that. And I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I know you're sorry. Like you've been sorry the whole time, but like nothing's changed. Um,
I didn't really know how to explain them that at the time that I was incapable of that because I'm not sure I knew. Someone also called me a monster once. That was pretty sick. <laughs> pretty awesome to hear that you're a monster. I think what they really meant was you don't you don't give a crap about anybody else but yourself. Which again, true. The worst part about hearing all of these things and thinking about them all now is that they're all right. I hate admitting that people are right. <laughs> But they're they're all absolutely correct about me. And the only thing I can do now at some point is is go back and make amends to them. Say, hey, I've really done a lot of work in my life. I really have. Uh, but what they all did at these points when they said these things to me, these were all the points where they were leaving me. All of these people left. And they told me they were leaving. They didn't just leave. They said, I can't do this anymore. You are terrible i'm leaving and i am very grateful to them for that i'm incredibly grateful to them for incredibly grateful to them for leaving because that was the only thing that they could have done that would have helped me was leave was to leave me with nobody else but myself to to blame to consider for all of the things that had happened around me that were bad i had nobody left and things were still going wrong so clearly it's me and the only people that could help me were other addicts. That was it. That's all I had. It was the only thing that worked. One of those friends told me, yeah, you, need, you need to get better first. And I told him I had had, uh, I hadn't smoked in seven days, I think is what I told him. <laughs> he was like, but you know, that's not what I meant, right? See you in a year, buddy. That's a large portion of pretty much what I had today. Uh, I mean, clearly I could talk ad nauseum, but I wanted to open the floor for questions at this point, and I wanted to thank Aubrey again for allowing me to speak today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Fen. That was incredible. Um, very, I mean, just heartfelt, authentic uh, share. And um, I just want to say um, that I'm glad you're here to share your story, because I know I personally, and I don't want to speak for everybody who's on this meeting, um, benefit from hearing you because it helps me understand um, the disease of addiction and the draw to use. And so I can do better in my life too and show up as healthy as I can um, in my life for the people that I know that are struggling. So thank you for being here, Finn. And we are so glad you did survive that and that you're here to share. And I could say, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't answer that question for you saying, I think I know, but I do think this is one of the reasons why you're here to help us. Um, would you mind sharing what step are you on today? Um, what step am I on today? That's actually a really difficult question to answer because I've been through some rounds of that, to be honest with you, but uh I've been with, with multiple people at this point going through them. So like one, but also, uh, sure. We'll go with, we'll go with one at this point. It's always, always that one. Uh, I just went to a meeting last night and the, we, the subject was step one, the powerlessness over this and yes. And and Phil, I see your hand up. Uh, happy to have you talk. I just I, I just want you to know that we need to keep it cordial here, please. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Aubrey. I knew that statement would come from you. Um, I, I'd like to also educate um, whenever I have the ability uh, to speak to someone. Um, as I'm a pharmacist, I had a sister who was a nurse get killed in downtown Seattle, Washington, by a marijuana impaired driver. And I know how lax the state of Washington is towards impaired drivers. So I'm not appalled or surprised at all by the way you were treated by the legal and or law enforcement um, group there and not being, not being put in jail like you thought you would be. Um, that's a rarity. Um, one one of the questions I had for you though was, um, you're blaming your 
your your impaired driving <clears throat> on alcohol alone. And as a pharmacologist, I know full well how long THC lasts in the body. So when was the last time you had used marijuana prior to that driving incident? Oh, I mean, I I, I guess I didn't quite clearly state this, but I mean, just like usual, I, was, I had been smoking all day. So like, it, yeah, it, it had an effect on the, the, for sure, the state of my driving. Okay. So I I'd appreciate in the future that you not limit um, the excuse to only alcohol driving because in reality, you were poly drug driving that day. Um, and that you be clear that that's exactly what's happening because as we know now, uh, poly drug driving is actually has exceeded alcohol impaired driving crashes in the United States of America. And so I think you're you're another exhibit of that. Um, and just to make, make it clear that that's exactly what, what had happened that day, I, I'd appreciate you doing that. And also you talk about making amends uh, that you speak of. And I think you owe it to those of us who have been fighting desperately for well over a decade. Hey, um, hey but Phil, we're not yeah. we're not here to shame anybody. This is a recovery meeting. So right. yeah, we need so, to move on, okay? So thank you. And, and Aubrey, I hey, will never attend another meeting that if you're going to cut me off like this. Well, I just, we're not behavior. here. We're not here to shame. It takes a lot of courage I'm not to here do. to shame. What I'm asking him to do is to help us um, and everyone that's been murdered by an addict to know that no longer has a voice to one of the things I think you can do to help us is to tell every legislator of your story of what legal cannabis is doing to our society. Um, we think that you, especially, um, you know, addicts could really, Phil, really help us. Phil, with uh, all due, due respect. Don't believe us. Phil, and, uh, and I'll let you let you comment here, Finn, in just a second. Phil, I have to keep the recovery and the advocacy diff, um, separate when it comes to these meetings. And there's a reason behind that part of the recovery process. And um, what Finn has is a brain disease and he needs to take good care of himself. And so, you know, not every person that has this disease can come forward and do advocacy work. Their main priority is their health and sharing their experience, strength, and hope in situations that they can um, feel comfortable with and stuff like that. So I, I just don't want this to be about pressuring and trying to control people to do what we want them to do. That's not recovery. And Phil, I give you my deepest condolences for the loss of your sister, and I appreciate all the work you do, and I appreciate your comments. Um, and I just think there's just a, a miscommunication about what recovery is and what advocacy is. So thank you for sharing and Finn, I'll let you make any comments if you would like to uh, with for Phil's comments. Sure, sure. Uh, I think it's a, I, th I think the drugs driving, the, that point you made is, is poignant. I think that it is. I, I drove very recklessly while I was high and I, you know, I was high all the time, but nonetheless, I would be smoking a joint in one hand and going like 85 to 90 miles per hour down the freeway uh, with my other on the steering wheel, right? So it wasn't, uh, I would, it was not, it's not safe at all what I was doing on a daily basis. And I deeply regret it at this point. I truly do. But I, I think the reason I mentioned the alcohol in particular is because without being impaired by alcohol at that, at that particular moment, I truly don't believe that I would have, uh, after crashing, like with no thoughts of what it seemed like in my brain driven 90 miles per hour down like a 35 mile per hour road. I don't think that I would have ran away that quickly. I don't think that I would have uh, gotten even close enough to the buildings or other people to, to slam my car through the, the brick wall. That is not to say that it was, uh, I'm not saying that it wasn't irresponsible of me to drive full hot because it, it, it absolutely was, it was totally completely wrong and dangerous and reckless all of that is completely true. But I do think that the alcohol in that particular case played a larger role in my the severity of my crash than the weed. Um, but again, thank you for bringing that up because I really should have made that more clear and I appreciate it. I also think that I could do a lot more work, you are right, to talk to, to legislators and just people in the uh, who can make a difference, really, somebody who can help. 
I try to make a difference on a small level with the people that I can. And uh, that's been really impactful, I think, to me personally. But you're right. I could be doing more work for that. And I appreciate your comments. Thank you. And I, I don't think he's part of the meeting anymore. And I would say, too, I think I know what Phil would say is the science shows that m using marijuana, um, mixing alcohol and marijuana, um, the alcohol intensifies the effects of THC. So that's it does. Why, this is true. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, that point of saying it's a, it was a drugged driving crash um, and appreciate you using the word crash, too, instead of accident. Um, um, it's probably the main point. And um, with that, so thank you. I was, also, I was also on Lexapro as well, which oh, evidently exactly. Lexapro increases the effects of alcohol. I don't know about marijuana, but I know that it increases the effects of alcohol as well. So there were a lot of factors, a, a cocktail of terrible things happening, basically, at that exact moment. Yeah. And thank God you're here to tell the story. Um, Brenda said for some reason her hand's not being able to raise, but she would like to ask you a question. Brenda? Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was great. I had a question about, um, you said that you went back home and you weren't, you know, your parents said about not smoking and everything. What else did your parents do um, or not do? do you think that led you to recovery? Well, one of the big things I think is as I was going home, a former roommate of mine who would soon become a new girlfriend as soon as I broke up with the other one, took all of my stuff, helped me move it. And then we started dating like two weeks later. And they were like, you're really putting all your work into this new relationship instead of recovery? Because it was just something to look at. It's like, yeah, I am. Okay, that's insane, but, you know, so long as you're, I guess, staying sober, then it's not really a problem. Here's the thing. This is a progressive illness, whether or not I am using it. If I have these spiritual afflictions that if I do not work on them, they will kill me. They will. So I think it was maybe a mistake for them not to say, if you're going to be in this house with me, you not only have to not smoke, I need you to do something about it. I need you to do anything about it at all. And not just kind of exist here in limbo, where you're basically in a rehab center with us. Right. But that said, it also wasn't their responsibility to fix anything about me. Right. So... I'm all, I almost wonder to this day if it was kind of a mistake for them to whisk me away to the safety of their house anyway. I think what really it was was I was I told them I'm feeling suicidal and they were like, okay, you're not killing yourself. You're coming home. Right. right. But at the same time, I think maybe it was kind of bad for me also. So, um, I, um, yeah. My son, um, this all started with what we thought was um, marijuana-induced psychosis in I didn't, at the time, my mother was dying on hospice in my house. And then 10 months later, my sister died. There was so much going on. And my son was always the kid that, it, and I know addiction has doesn't really have anything to do with if you have a good head on your shoulders, but I never had to worry about my son. So all this stuff was happening behind the scenes. And then he went into psychosis in March. Um, and we thought maybe it was a one-off from the marijuana. Now they're saying it's bipolar, but he never put the marijuana down. And I'm so torn between tough love and um, the psychological, like if I put him out on, I, I, he'd die out on the street. Do you know what I mean? And I also know I have, a, I totally understand addiction. I know that addict's memory, how, how you think it's, I'll never do this again. It's the worst thing. And, you know, when you're adamant and then something snaps and you just remember all the good. Like, I know I I can personally understand that. And I was just, he's been to a couple of um, uh, partial programs. He is one, he is med medication compliant. Um, but, and now he's four days off of weed. And I've been um, telling him about, because I've, been going to Maranon meetings and then from that is where I saw the link to this 
I've been telling them, I'm like, there's actually now one anonymous meeting, Sam. It's if it was, wasn't a pro so many people have that it's just pot mentality and I'm in Massachusetts and it's legal and it's terrible. And I know I'm babbling on, but I just, I'm, I'm stuck between the tough love and um, because I mean, the psychosis, it, it was, it was bad. It was like hide under his mattress. Uh, he was apparently talking to Andrew Tate, that guy, I mean, all kinds of things, you know, whatever. And it's, it's just, uh, so I'm just kind of starting my journey here. And I just didn't know, like if your parents, they, if they did any kind of like tough love or that was all, I, I just, I get so torn sometimes. Well, I think what my mom would say if you were here, her, mm -hmm. her advice at this point is probably, um, are you are you, you co-parents with somebody? Yes. Oh yeah, dad's here. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, her advice has always been just get on the same page with your partner and do something. I think is what she had said at, at, at a meeting. Pick mm -hmm. something to do. You know, decide together what it is that you're going to do. Um, and that's that was what they did. At least they, yeah. They both sat me down and they said, "Hey, we are paying for you to live in this apartment. I want you to know that if you keep using you, we aren't going to do that anymore. I mean, we're not going to do it forever, but we're certainly not going to do it in the next month if you continue to use. Because all we're doing is supporting you. And uh, you know, I was mad at them for that, yeah. but I also I also understood uh, because. They were just throwing money in a in a pit, basically. That's how they that's how that's how actually they phrased it to me. They were like, "We're just throwing money into a pit." There's and it doesn't seem like there's any bottom at this point. So, if you could uh, if you could hit bedrock or something <laughs> at some point here, and then maybe get a ladder to get back out, that would be really awesome. Right, right. Um, can yeah. Brenda, are you Lacey? Can we contribute to it positively or negatively? Um, knowing where our boundaries are as a family can be very, it can uh, be blurred for us family members. <laughs> those questions you ask are legitimate questions and hard questions to answer. So in that group, we openly discuss those situations. Okay, okay. To clear it up for you so you know where your boundaries lie. So you don't have to do one extreme or the other extreme. You, you might find something like, right. hey, that's a boundary I can hold and I'm going to do that. So just to bring okay, hope sure. back into the situation, please join us. We'd, we'd love to have yeah, you. I'd love to. And Finn, thank you so much because you are definitely, um, I'm going to cry. Um, you know, you're, you're an example of it can, it can work a day at a time. And um, I have, I have hope for my son. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. I, I have hope for your son. Christine, would you like to ask a question? Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, Finn, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I had two quick questions. We had an interruption and I missed part of what you said in response to the last question. Did you say that you your parents told you when you came back um, that you can't use? Did you say that you wished they would have required you to go to treatment? I wasn't sure. You know, I I, I both I both wish that they would have and also know that I would not have done that. Yeah. So so I don't I don't really know what a good answer for that is. I, I don't okay. think that in high, I, you know, I said that I wish they had done that. And I think maybe yeah. I'd like to revise that. I okay. wish I, I wish I, I would have done that. Maybe yeah. would have been a better way to put it. OK. Yeah. And then my second question is, um, can you describe like I know you said you started going to those meetings at the end and then you just continue going um, like what exactly your recovery looked like in terms of what you did and what actions you took and that kind of thing. A recovery group of other addicts and I said out loud while crying, um, can somebody please effing help? And I, I did not censor myself. Mm -hmm. I said that when I shared. And they were all looked at me and they were like, oh yeah, <laughs> sure, that's, that's what we do. So I, I, I really just kept going. I just kept going and going, going, going. And uh, every twice a week is what I did. And eventually I said, okay, maybe I should actually look into the, the program a little bit more and doing some work personally rather than just sitting in these meetings. But mm. the only thing I did to begin with was just sit down in the chair for an hour twice a week 
like like a marijuana anonymous meeting um there are some personal conflicts i guess which stating which meeting oh. directly but oh so sorry uh, okay no it's okay but uh it was it was a group of other addicts yes. yeah okay thank you I, I will say also in the chat i think julie noted okay she had a question oh julie has a question okay two questions was it already legalized for ad adults when you were 14? And that did that make it easier to fall into it? I mean, the truth, now that I think about it, I don't know. I, I have okay. no idea. I, I actually don't know when, what year it was legalized in Washington State. I didn't even consider. It was 2014 oh. when I was 14. I was born in the year okay. 2000. So, so it was legal. That yeah, was, okay. was the year. I mean, it kind of became legal in 2012 because yeah. you get arrested. It wasn't legal for teens, but it was legal for adults. Do you think people are waking up in Washington State to how dangerous this is? That they've seen enough people that have had similar experience either psychosis or addiction experiences that understanding how dangerous it is is becoming better and better known is it i i guess i don't uh, i don't know <laughs> and i'm sorry oh, to tell you i don't know well i know it's definitely more normalized at this point yeah. and I, I know that like it's a very similar even uh I feel like advertisement rate, at least around Bellingham to like alcohol billboards, you know, it's sincerely everywhere. And I have told a few people like my coworkers, whatever, that I'm in recovery. And a few of them have actually said to me, I, I feel like I really have a problem with weed. Can I come do a group with you? So yeah. at least, on, at least on a personal level, I have noticed more and more people thinking, okay, I might be an addict. I might be a weed addict. I really might. And then realizing, okay, I am, I am. Now what do I do? You know? Okay. Okay. Because it doesn't sound like it's really hit the consciousness of people yet. Okay. Well, that's the, the dispensaries are still everywhere. There are two on my walk to work. There's another one about a quarter mile down away from my, you know, they are really, really everywhere. So yes. it's, it's hard. Yes. <laughs> I won't lie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we'll go to Winnie next. Would you have a question? Hi, Winnie. Hey everybody and uh thank you finn for speaking to us tonight i really am grateful to hear your story um my question for you is related to um your workplace um and i know that you know marijuana is just everywhere nowadays and you mentioned you know using at work on prior jobs <laughs> at your current job is do people use it around you and how do you deal with that? Um, my son is an addict and people use it during his, during work hours at his job. And it's very, very difficult, makes it very, very difficult for him. So if just, if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah. At the job I had before this, I, I was in recovery and I, I recently got a new one like two weeks ago, actually, but the one just before my most recent one, there were, Quite a few people at the job who would bring a weed pen or would talk about weed or just said they were excited to go home and get high. And you probably, you'll likely encounter that in a lot of places, especially in states where it's legal. And, and it's the same with alcohol, right? You know, I'm, I'm going to get drunk tonight. Just kind of, it seems normal. But it was really, really, really hard to hear. And there's no way I could just say, hey, can you please, like, not. You know, because if it's a collective of people, I felt kind of wrong, like ruining their fun just because I happen to be an addict. Maybe it's not wrong to advocate for myself on that way, but it felt like it. And really getting a new, I'm sorry to say for your son, getting a new job has been very helpful. Um, finding, just getting out of that environment, because I really, even if you're new in recovery, it was, it, I was new in recovery and, and it, it's it's never felt fine, you know, to be around it. It's never felt okay. It's always given me an itch, basically. Um, I, I maybe I'd say cravings pass. They do. Fifteen to twenty minutes. Drink some water. It's it's gone. Uh, but to have to experience those cravings all the time and be in a place where they're brought constantly brought up to you is hard. So I I empathize. I I also sympathize. With your son, I feel bad for him, and I hope that maybe he can find a place that's a little better for him. 
Thank you. Thank you. Sandra, are you able to unmute now? Oh, good. Hi. Yes, I, 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 I am. Thank you for the invite to this meeting, and thank you, Fen, for sharing. Um, I listened very carefully to you, Fen, and gained some insights, I believe, into. I mean, you shared how you felt when you were uh, using, and and. So, because I've been wondering what my daughter is feeling, you know, she's, she's been a um, cannabis smoker for six years, been in recovery off and on. She left home six weeks ago with her dog, left everything in psychosis, and um, just... Uh, She's blocked me. She's blocked everybody in the family. She's active on social media. Even though her account's private, I can see her followers increasing like crazy. But, And I know she's struggling, and it's breaking my heart that, that she's having these um, thoughts that are causing her to suffer. So when you were active in it, um, you were realizing these things were going on, and you didn't know you felt like you were going crazy, right? Yeah, is that the, is that the, yeah, I did. I mean, well, I felt kind of like, kind of like I was watching myself from a bird's eye do these things as though I was sort of in a third person. And whereas I, I didn't, I didn't want to make the decisions, but also I felt like it wasn't my choice. And <clears throat> I don't know. You make enough of these decisions. You do enough of these things. You live this miserably for a long time. And suddenly, I just one day basically thought, I, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. In fact, I don't want to live. So, where do I go from here? And that's, yeah. the, I think that's the point where, at least, I had to get as an addict to just kind of utter, oh, I'm sorry to say, kind of just utter despair to the point where you go, okay, there has to be something else. Clearly, I have exhausted all pathways here. This is a dead end no matter where I go. So yeah. let's, let's backtrack and what's next, you know? Well, the problem is she has a trust fund and she keeps getting money from them. And mm -hmm. so she's doing her thing. But at the same time, she's not functioning Right. I mean, I've I've emailed her. I said, you you can come home. She said, no, the neighbors are serial killers. <laughs> and then she claims she's 18 pregnant. She's, she's not pregnant, hasn't been pregnant. And, and she's she has to have this cesarean, this dead baby out of her thesis. She's been to hospitals. They tell her she's not pregnant. This is really severe psychosis she's in. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's bad. And she texted me i hadn't heard from her in weeks till night before last she texted me at 3 30 in the morning call my trust i i don't want to be i don't want to die out in the rain my car is impounded i have to get my car out and um and that was the last i heard i, I did talk to her trust and they sent her money but i don't even know where she was where the car was so I took two hours of time. I knew the car's VIN number and I found where it was impounded and it was released. That's all I, and that was in Hollywood, California. She was in Arizona. So I just, I'm praying for her that she knows she can come home. She knows when she gets here that there's no weed in her system. That was my boundary and she was doing good here. But then I had to leave to go to Washington state. My brother had a stroke and, she was taking care. I had went up twice, once in August and once in September. She was taking good care of the house. We were in close communication. And then in September, that's when she relapsed. And I didn't realize she was hiding it. When I got home, she just said, I'm going to go walk my dog or I'm going to go this store and that store or I'm in Chico shopping and and because I live in Shasta County. But anyway, she was finding, making up excuses to go smoking. I was giving her the benefit of the doubt until I started seeing her thinking going south, you know. Yeah. And then one day, one morning, she just um, 
I haven't recorded. I haven't. I can't bring myself to listen to the thing again because it scared the crap out of me. I went in my room and locked the door. She was saying crazy things, and next thing I know, she's gone. Oh, so she's from your your talk. Thank you for sharing. I know she's battling in her internally right now, and hopefully, nothing happens to her, and she finds her way to recovery too, back to recovery. Yeah. So it gives me hope. it gives me hope that that inside of her there's a pull to live and to she just got to realize hey this ain't working I'm not getting an apartment she's staying in Airbnbs she's not managing her her money right that she's getting from the trust she couldn't even pay her cell phone because I try to call every now and then even though it's blocked and. And so I, I saw that it was turned off. I did pay it for her so that she could have a phone. <laughs> but anyway, I <sighs> I think um, I'm trying my best not to sort of give advice because in particular the situation, I, I did not experience as severe as like, I just kind of experienced incredible paranoia that I, that I believed so I've come to terms with the fact that it's paranoid psychosis at this point, but it was never, uh, it was never something as, as serious as, you know, uh, I guess this wouldn't apply to me, but I'm pregnant and I'm not, you know, no matter what I, I was, I was trying my best. I was, I was doing what I could and I really felt like I wanted to get better. Even if my body and mind weren't really letting me, there was still a desire there. So I didn't give up. I think I just tried a bunch of different stuff until I decided that one would work and it did. I believe she's this feels the same way. She's trying her best. I know she is, but she's not it's not her best when she's hampered by this substance in her toxic yeah. chemicals in her brain. She's yeah. And okay, so you didn't have the um the uh you had paranoid delusions she has somatic and, and and persecutory and yeah she's got the whole gamut going on mm. well if I, anybody I, out there she's ducky d-u-c-k-i-i -I dot momo on instagram and facebook and she's i don't know what she's posting i can't see it but ducky momo with two eyes Maybe somebody can give her some light in her dark world. Sandra, I'm so sorry um, to hear your daughter is suffering. What? What's? Can I ask what state she's in? Is there a Marchman Act or some kind of um, legality way you can um, help her get the, tr the the help she needs? Is there anybody on your your side with that in your state? You know. Um, I have looked into Laura's law. I'm in California. And before, at one point, not this year, but last year, early last year, I went and filed all the paperwork to do the, the black robe effect to get court-ordered treatment because she wasn't listening to my boundaries to not smoke here. And we had the crisis unit out here and so on and so forth. But anyway, so they proved it. And the thing is, in this county, that there's a shortage of judges. So they said, we can't even get a court date to get this approved. But we can offer a counselor to talk to her. We have this program. We get a lot of AB 109ers here in this county uh, out of prison. Not a bunch of nice people. And they're in recovery fine. But my daughter doesn't need to be. She was in a toxic relationship with a guy that just got out of prison at one time. So offering her that program here to be around them, them again with her vulnerable state was not an option. Sure. So I, told I don't know if you've reported her as a missing person and in, that's um, in danger to herself. Um, you might want to explore that too. So if she does come across the police, that there's a report and that maybe they can possibly get her into a treatment program too. I don't know. That Fine line there. Yeah. Now, they, is she a danger to herself? Well, to others, if she's driving on high on cannabis, yeah. Yeah. You know, there is a bolo out for her in, in this county. I don't know if they put it on the state that, that she's, you know, 
driving like that. So she goes off and on on the Facebook. So I had one friend in another group I'm in that sent me some of her posts a few weeks ago, but she hasn't been able to see her since. So I don't know if she blocked that lady because she saw that lady's a friend with my, me. I don't know. Um, also consider coming to our Marinon meeting tomorrow. If you're not, if, oh, you are going to Marinon meetings. I think you said, um, but yeah, we have and the climbers group. I'm thank you. I'm going to check that out too. Okay. My daughter's such a beautiful person. That's hey. Yeah. Well, our hearts are with you, Sandra. Um, we, we, we send you all our love and, um, and we're going to keep her in our prayers and hope that uh, she can find a way to path to recovery. And and Finn is a prime example of that it can it can happen. So we'll keep mm -hmm. up the hope and we'll we'll surround you with love. Just accept our virtual hugs to you right now. Thank you. Yes. And thank you. And you, you're you're an inspiration and and uh, very courageous young man. <laughs> yes, he is. And, Thank you. Um, thank you for saying so. Just thank you for uh, being here to hear my story. I my best goes out to your daughter. I know that she'll find her way someday. Thank you. So here, here's a question, sure. and then there's a lot of great comments in the chat. Um, I'm curious. Do you always have that perspective of feeling like you were looking at yourself from outside, or do you think you have that perspective might be a step towards recovery? And then Finn answered. Do you want to you want to say your answer, Finn? Sure. I just said I mostly experienced that feeling once I had gotten better already and was relapsing. Once I knew who I was when I was sober again, I could see the difference in my actions during active addiction. That's true. I mean, I, I from 14 on, I was smoking, so I wasn't sure. I guess I knew who sober Finn even was, but then once I did and I relapsed again, I kind of felt like, like I said, I was looking at myself from a bird's eye, just um do all of these things that I, I, I didn't know who that was doing. A, he looked like me, he talked like me, pretty much acted like me, but I didn't, I didn't know what he was doing or why. Okay. I particularly like this comment from, um, I like them all, but this one from Lynn, I cannot even imagine being as vulnerable as you were tonight. You should be a speaker. I believe you will change many lives. I agree with that, Lynn. He's already changing all of our lives. So um, appreciate that comment. Well, I don't know if I can take credit for changing lives, but nonetheless, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you're bringing hope back into the conversation and, um, and into the situations where we don't necessarily feel that. So um, recovery is possible. Sincerely. Um, I, I, when I got my DUI, I went to a victim impact panel where this guy shared a story of being in a horrific car crash where he was really hurt and got better. And afterwards I went up to him and I was like, I, I really, I really thought my life was over when I got the car crash and it turns out it's not. He goes, it's, it's so not, it's so not over. It's just starting. Like don't even think that it's over for a second. So since then I've kind of felt it my duty to at least talk to somebody about how it's, it's, it's not over. <laughs> 